And this gentleman is very special. This is General Bill Anders. And uh, may I call you Bill? Sure. Can. Everybody else did. I noticed last night at the Friday night celebration at the museum. But uh, and they were telling hangar stories. We can't tell those. So. <laughs> but uh, Bill, you have had a wonderful uh, experience uh, in your uh, military life, and and I know your personal life. I haven't asked about that. But uh, you went to the Naval Academy. First of all, you were born in Hong Kong, weren't born, you? My dad was a, a sand pebble like Steve McQueen. Oh, really? On the Yangtze River Patrol in, uh, in 1936 and 37. And uh, in fact, when his ship was sunk, the Panay, uh, he took over before it was sunk, got the Navy Cross, and we believe he was oh, the my. first American naval officer to order open fire on the Japanese. Isn't that something? And my mother and I had to escape China. We were bombed en route. So, uh, my military career started at four. Oh, you should write a book, Bill. Well, or somebody, have you? some people have told me that. Oh, my, yeah. Uh, but then you went to the Naval Academy, didn't you? Went to the Naval Academy, uh, sort of it seemed to be expected because my dad was a yes. Naval Academy grad. But uh, after seeing those short carrier decks and those nice, long Air Force concrete runways, <laughs> I took the option of uh, uh. jumping ship. 25% uh, of the class was commissioned into the Air Force because they didn't have an Air Force Academy in those mm -hmm. days. So then you got your master's at, uh, at the Air Force later, Institute. Later uh, I got technology. my uh, master's right up here up the road at, uh, at Wright-Patterson Field and at Air Force Institute of Technology. Oh, that's so great. we lived in Huber Heights for two years. Oh, really? We had a daughter born there, yes. Oh, my. Now you have how many children? We have six. Six? Six, uh, four boys and two girls. Oh, and, that's uh, great. Four of them are going to be with us here uh, tonight. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, do they live here? They live? No, they mostly on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, two of them up near where we live in Bellingham, my two boys who help uh, and who run our Heritage Flight Museum. That's uh, this yes, one. Yes, And that's then uh, two others down in San Diego. Well, we have to talk a little bit about uh, you were chosen to be in the astronaut program mm -hmm. in 1963, I think it was. Yes. But then the big flight that everybody remembers, the Apollo 8. That was uh, a real piece of, of history. Christmas yeah. Eve, I remember that. Christmas so. Eve, we were oh. orbi orbiting the moon. No, oh, yes. the flight originally was supposed to be an Earth orbital flight, testing mm -hmm. the lunar module, but two things happened. The lunar module fell behind schedule, and uh, the uh, CIA picked up vibrations that the Russians were going to try to upstage us again oh my. and put a, a vehicle around the moon, mm. and which would have been a very big PR coup. So um, they changed our flight. I suddenly lost my lunar module, and uh, we went uh, for the first flight on the Saturn V, first ones to leave Earth orbit, and we la laid out the bread crumb crumbs uh, on how to get to the moon. Mm. And then you took this picture. Let's turn. We have swivel chairs here a little bit. They'll talk about this is Earthrise, they call it. <clears throat> well, I was lucky enough to, uh, and as did the rest of the crew, to uh, witness the first uh, Earth rising, first time the Earth was seen rising above the uh, stark uh, lunar surface. Mm. And uh, it was ironic in that we had come to uh, study the moon. We'd been riding on these uh, highly complex new vehicles. And when people ask me what impressed me most Apollo, about Apollo 8, it was neither, you know, the moon or the hardware. It was the view of our beautiful Earth. planet, uh, particularly uh -huh. as it was contrasted by the ugly uh, lunar surface. Well, then, of course, uh, Christmas Eve, you read from the Bible and uh, from Genesis, and uh, that was just... Uh, well, that, uh, our flight just, uh, it just happened to fall over the Christmas period. Uh, and uh, Frank Borman came up with the idea of reading from the Old Testament because it's also a big Jewish holiday season. But the words he chose, uh, the first verse of Genesis, were basically uh, in uh, many religions. And we really didn't do it as a religious act. Uh, it was more uh, to just say something uh, serious, something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, emotionally grabbing. Yes. Uh, for the people on Earth to let them know that something really different was underway, that humans now had mm. broken away from their planet that was created uh, and, uh, and were now uh, venturing into the near 
uh, cosmos. Now, I want to ask you, you orbited how many times? Ten times? We orbited ten times. Ten times. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it like? A completely dark on the other dark side of the moon? No, that's a common misconception that, uh, the, that there's the dark side of the moon. The dark side of the moon changes every day, and, and that's why sometimes we see a nice big full moon uh, where the backside is dark, because always the moon is locked in. It always has one side facing away. But in our case, when the moon is very new, as it was on our flight, it was just a little illuminated sliver. Mm. It was the front side that was dark and the back side that was illuminated. And we've seen, because mm. we went when the moon was the newest of any of the Apollo flights, we've seen more of the back side than anybody has. Was and, there a difference in temperature at all? Well, it's, uh, it's very warm uh, down on the back side of the moon. Oh. Uh, it gets down, it gets up to over boiling uh, in the lunar afternoon, which takes mm. 15 days. Uh, and in the, uh, just before sunrise, if you will, on the, uh, on the shady part of the moon, uh, it gets way down uh, below freezing. Mm. So that's why the spacesuits and the temperature control systems in the spacecraft uh, and in the uh, uh, spacesuits have to be so uh, capable. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember um, hearing that, of course, and it was in 1968, I think, but it was oh, just really something, men up there, you know, well, When we went behind the moon, we were alone. Oh. There was, we couldn't hear any uh, radio signals from Earth. If we had a problem, they'd never know what happened. And uh, so we were all by ourselves back there. And Frank Borman uh, was on the... Uh, crew, he was the commander, yes. and then Jim Lovell, and they're both here, which yes. speaks very well for you, Bill. Well, we're both <laughs> here, and uh, we're That's proud to wonderful. say that the Apollo 8 crew were still married to the same lovely wives. <laughs> That's great. And uh, they're, well, Susan Borman couldn't come because of some, uh, some health issues, but uh, both uh, my wife, Valerie, and Marilyn Lovell are here. And then after you um, left, and, uh, well, you retired a major general, but then uh, you went with GE. First with General Electric, uh -huh. yes, and then uh, running their first their nuclear manufacturing business, and mm. then uh, running their aircraft equipment business, basically up in upstate New York and around. And then I went as chief operating officer for Textron, uh, which uh, was a, uh, a conglomerate, they had all kinds of different products, but uh, uh, was uh, asked just before the Cold War ended to be chairman and, uh, and chief operating officer of General Dynamics. Oh. And it was pleased me very much last night, that, to my pleasant surprise, that the General Dynamics Corporation, which I've left many years ago, was a big funder of the, uh, of the dinner last night. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. That was, that was great. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask you about, you also were an ambassador to Norway. Yes, I was. It's not yeah. Norsk. That's uh, all I know. <laughs> elite. <laughs> elite. <laughs> a little. But, uh, or uh, talk for Martin, as you speak. Talk for Martin, yes. Right. Yes, we were over there in uh, Oslo, mm -hmm. and we had some friends up in Sheehan. Uh, he was a painter. But the, the wonderful people over there. Oh, yes, they're very nice uh, people, very good uh, allies. Yes. Uh, strong supporters of the United States, and it was, uh, it was a real pleasure you know, oh, to have yeah. the job of ambassador over there. You were there for how many years? I was there for a year, but Jimmy Carter, when he came along, uh, I guess he thought I was political, even though I wasn't. So uh, <laughs> he made me start working for a living. <laughs> well, Bill, it was certainly delightful to be able to talk to you and have visited with you up at the uh, luncheon today. And um, Frank and um, Jim Lovell being here, I know, is a big, big... Do you get to see one another at all? We, we get together pretty regularly. Oh, that's uh, great. And uh, maybe a couple of times a year. And uh, we're working together to come up with a, an Apollo 8 video. Oh, that's and, great. Uh, we hope to be able to get that funded. And, uh, and uh, that we see each other a lot that's on that great. basis, too. Well, good luck, and we'll see you tonight. Well, great. It's great to be back in Dayton. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, used to live in Huber Heights. Oh, Huber Heights. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you. We'll be back.